record this for YouTube. Sorry. So today's first question is uh, for uh, given graphs, we are supposed to estimate the elastic modulus. So in graph 1, we were given the full graph till the fracture. In graph 2, we were given the zoomed in version. So to get the elastic modulus, you actually need to get the slope in the elastic raising. So consider any two data points and then the slope you can estimate from the difference in y's by the, and the ratio of uh, difference in x's. So, y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1. So, here because the starting point is 0, 0, we are taking one of the uh, points on the graph 150 and 0 0.0018. So, for these two points, we can estimate the slope as y2 is 150, y1 is 0, x2 is 0 0.0018 and x1 is 0. Then the ratio is your elastic modulus. Okay. Yes. Yeah. See here, this is the slope. This is the ratio of stress to strain in the elastic resin following the Hooke's law. Ultimate tensile strength is the point where the material starts uh, necking. So, what it exactly means is, let us say you are using that component to handle some load in some operation and so uh, if you increase the load even little bit more from the tensile strength case so it just fails breaks if you increase the force okay so that is a different point it could be a polymer or anything it might not have any elastic resin to begin with but ultimate tensile strength is the point where it starts necking okay so this here we have done a strain control test what I mean is we are changing the displacement and seeing the stress inside the material. But let us say you did the force control. This graph would not be the same. If you are control, if you are changing the force and let it equilibrate to the strain, then till this point you would get the same thing. But um, it would break here because uh, Hmm. No, 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 no. It is not related to strength at all. You see the units of elastic modulus, they are in GPA. And uh, see the ultimate tensile strength, it is in MPA. So, this does not tell the strength. What it tells is for the given strain or the given force, what should be the strain? Okay. So, elastic modulus and ultimate tensile strength are very different. Okay. So, is that clear at least? So, elastic modulus, we are only talking about the stress and strain in the elastic limit, the ratio between them. How does uh, uh, strain increase with respect to stress? Ultimate tensile strength is the point where it should start snaking. Failure. That is it. So, in the elastic resin, there is no failure. Uh, so, Mm. Okay. Okay. See, modulus of rigidity, you mean the shear modulus? See, that is uh, shear modulus is, uh, see, when you are doing the tensile strength, tensile test, No, as per the definition, I am seeing uh, shear modulus or modulus of rigidity. So, I am not exactly sure what you are meaning here. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. 
See, tensile strength and elastic modulus are two different properties of the material. Yeah, they are not related to each other. They can be, uh, let's take polymer films. They can stretch a lot and their elastic modulus could be 1 GPA, but the breaking point could be 10 MPA. And for a material like steel, the elastic modulus could be 200 GPA, but the breaking could be 400 MPA or 200 MPA. These two are unrelated properties. One in the elastic regime, what is the ratio between stress and strain? One while breaking, what is the maximum stress it can handle? So, if you are given one, you can't estimate the other one. As per my understanding. Uh, if your doubt is even more clear, you can ask in the discussion forum. I will check with my professor and then I uh, will get back to you. Yeah. Yes, once you draw the graph, then only you will be able to identify these points. Otherwise, it would be difficult to see. Yeah. Yeah. You can just take any graph paper and then start drawing. Like. Uh, the values won't be very critical like they won't ask you like point point this thing they, the answers would be in some range so even if you get any value that would be taken as correct answer yeah so the second question is uh, to find the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength so it's very difficult to identify from where the plastic deformation starts so the general thumb rule is you take the 0.2 percent strain which corresponds to strain of 0.002 and draw a line parallel to the elastic resin. So, the point at which it intersects the graph is taken as the yield strength. Okay. And for the ultimate tensile strength, the peak of the stress strain graph or the point at which it starts snaking. So, that is the ultimate tensile strength. Yeah. So, and for the third question, uh, we were given the stress strain graph same. We were asked to calculate the maximum load that a cylindrical shape of dia 12 mm can take. So, the maximum load will be usually the point where uh, the ultimate tensile strength is. So, in this case, uh, here we are giving the engineering stress. So, it is the ratio of the force to the initial area and uh, the maximum load will be at the maximum stress which is ultimate tensile strength. So, the maximum load would be ultimate tensile strength into initial area. So, in this case, the ultimate tensile strength came out to be 450 MPa and the initial die is given as 12 mm. So, the area is uh, pi d square by 4. So, here uh, MPa we are writing in terms of Newton per mm square. So, mm square and mm square gets cancelled. Uh, we will get the force in terms of Newtons. So, ultimate tensile strength into area. Okay. So, this will give us the maximum load. Next question, uh, for the length given stress strain graph, change in length at a tensile stress of 350 MPa. So, we were given the stress state and asked what is the length of the specimen at that state. So, is this straightforward or uh, does anyone uh, have an opinion or how we can do this? So, basically we were given the y point and uh, graph is given, we are asked to identify the x. So, change in length we are asked, right? So, delta L. So, how is uh, engineering strain related to the change in length? It is uh, simple, it is just the change in length by the initial length, right? So, now we need to find what is the change in length. So, that is delta L into epsilon naught into L naught. And how will we get epsilon? Because we know the graph, so we, that means we know the relationship between stress and strain. And it is given stress is 350 MPa. So, this is 300, this is 400, so 320, 340, so this is 350. So, you draw a straight line below and the 
corresponding string so this is point 1 so this would be 0 0.02 0 0.04 0 0.06 and this is 0 0.08 okay so it's uh, let's take it as 0 0.0 this would be 0 0.07 so let's take epsilon as 0 0.065. So in your assignment answers, if questions like this are there, they will usually be in the range. So any value would work. Okay. So 0 0.065 into L0. This is the change in length. So if you are given the initial length, you can estimate the change in length. So is this clear? So, in the case where you are not given the graph, but you are told that you are in the elastic regime. Yeah, we will see a question on that uh, later on. So, then we will discuss that. Okay. So, what does this mean? So, you are given the elastic modulus and you are given the stress. So, the strain you can just estimate it as the ratio of stress to the elastic modulus. Let us say 200 GPA. So, the strain would be 350 by 200 into 10 power minus 3. So, now once you know the strain, you can estimate the change in length. Okay, so this is the case if there is no graph and it was told that it is in elastic regime. So once it crosses the elastic regime, this equation is not valid. This Hooke's law is not valid. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. Yeah. So yeah, as you are asked, that percentage area will be the next question. Now we are asked what is ductility in terms of percentage elongation. So, what exactly is ductility to begin with? What does ductility of a material tell us? So, it basically tells us uh, the, it is a number which can quantify the measure of plastic deformation. So, plastic deformation is basically, it is irreversible deformation, right? So, this percentage elongation. So, this ductility is given actually in two ways. One either in percentage elongation or percentage reduction in area. So, here we are asked to calculate in terms of percentage elongation, that is it. So, here uh, we know that it broke here, right. So, this is the point at which it broke. So, the ductility in terms of percentage of elongation is Okay. So, the change, total change in length till the fracture point. So, if you are, uh, uh, can you unmute? Yeah. So, because uh, we know this strain. So, what is LF minus L0 by L0? So, this is basically the strain at fracture, right? Engineering strain at fracture. So, what is this point? This is 0 0.03. 4, 6 and 0 0.038. So, let us take it as 0 0.037. Okay. So, this is 3.7 percent. No, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, this is 0 0.36 and this is 0 0.38. So, I wrote wrong. Yeah. Okay. So, this is 0 0.4, 0 0.36. So, it is in between those two. So, let us take it as 0 0.37 as the epsilon at fracture, strain at fracture. 
So the percentage elongation is 0.37 into 100 in percentages. So 37 percent. So is this clear? So here we are asked ductility in terms of percentage elongation. Now, yeah. So this is the question uh, for the given stress strain estimate the ductility in terms of percentage reduction in area. So can you actually, with, if we do not know the diameter at fracture, uh, by knowing only the lengths or the strengths, can we actually estimate percentage reduction in area? So, why do you think it's, uh, yes, uh, because you are expecting if you know the delta L by L, uh, you would know the delta A by A, right? Yeah, but this is relation holds, basically this comes from uh, volume is not changing. So, in this case, uh, uh, delta V is you can write it as uh, delta L into delta area, right? Okay. Now, this is not changing. So, that is why uh, these two are related. So, let us say delta L by L is uh, 5 percent. Now, delta A by A should compensate for this delta L by L. So, that there is no change in volume. Okay. So, basically um, that comes to V is equal to length into area. So, if you write dV, this you can write as dL into area plus L into dA. So, if the change in volume is 0, then dL by dLA plus LDA equal to 0. That means dL, you can write it this way, minus LDA. So, dL by L is equal to minus dA by A. So, in this case, yes, if you know dL by L, which you can get from strain, you can get dA by A. But this is only true till necking. So, that is the interest important point here. This is only true till necking. That means this point. So, once you cross this point, uh, you can't say volume is not changing. Now, the volume also changes. So, this does not true, is not true. Okay. So, that is why if you want to estimate the ductility in terms of reduction in area, you need to know the diameter at fracture. So, ductility in terms of uh, percentage reduction in area is area final minus area initial by area initial into 100. So, area is pi d square by 4 minus uh, so pi by 4 you can just take it out d f square minus d naught square by d naught square into 100 in percentages. Is this clear? Okay. Now, if you substitute, uh, then you would get the your answer 10.7 and 12.8. Yes, this is percentage reduction in area. Okay. Previous one is percentage elongation, so percentage change in length. So, these two would not actually give you same values because after making this does not uh, is not true. So, both of them will actually give you different values, but both of them are terms of ductility only. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah. So, let us move on to the next question. For the yes, yes. Yes. What, what? Yeah. 
yes yes so this percentage reduction in area i am just writing it as uh, area final minus area initial by area initial so this positive or negative it depends on your definition you can either put a not minus af or af minus a not yeah negative value this will give negative value percentage reduction in area so you can maybe uh, tell tell in terms of positive only because we are anyway saying in the definition it's reduction so that's up to you uh, i am not exactly sure what did the test book follow but this is how you would get okay yeah uh, in the let when i upload i will check the textbook and uh, put the exact formula okay uh, when i upload this so you know that all these are uploaded right in the youtube and in the yeah so the documents are also uploaded so while uploading i'll uh, put the correct formula Uh, so you know that there is a google drive uh, link where you can access all the earlier uh, documents also right everyone yeah yeah okay so next uh, move on to the next question so the question is what is the true stress at fracture because this is engineering stress and engineering strain we are asked to estimate the true stress at fracture and we were given the dia at fracture so can anyone tell me how to get this is that right so let's just make it uh, a not so this is the engineering stress but in true stress uh, it's f by instantaneous area right now because you know sigma e and a not you can estimate the f so from that f you can keep that here because you know the diode fracture you can keep that then you will get the true stress so let's see uh, force uh, yeah see the true stress is the actual stress but we can't exactly find that so that's why what we do is uh, because we are engineers we are like let's take the initial area and then uh, uh, just take the ratio of the force with that area and call that engineering stress when we are doing the tensile test but engineering stress is not the actual stress in the material actual stress in the material depends on the uh, actual force and the current instantaneous area but when it starts necking Uh, the area keeps changing or when you ke uh, kept on loading the area keeps on changing because it's elongating right so when it elongates the area reduces so the area keeps on changing and it's very difficult to track that area at each instant so because of that we are uh, doing this uh, in terms of initial area itself so that is easier to measure for us and track so we call that engineering stress and to get the actual true stress you need to know the actual area so that is this uh, true stress this is the actual stress in the material in the stress strain graph what you would see this sigma is assuming that the diameter is not changing is calculated like this only because when you are doing this tensile test what you can track are the force you are applying because there is a force sensor and the displacement okay these are the only two things you can track nothing else so what you do because you know the initial area of the sample you measure using vernier calipers or digital screw gauge or anything you divide that force whatever force instantly with that initial area okay so that you plot as y axis sigma which is engineering stress and how do you get the strain you know the displacement because you have displacement sensor which will measure the displacements and you know the initial length so the displacement 
by the initial length will give you that engineering strength. So these two are the things which will directly get from the force versus displacement graph. Now, if you want to get the actual stress, you need to account for the changing area. Yeah, that uh, you uh, the only way is uh, maybe you can have a camera and then uh, put a graph paper behind and track the changes, but that's not actually possible. Mathematics is a very different. Mathematics is everything theoretical. They don't care about how you actually achieve it experimentally. Yes. So that, uh, yeah. So you want the relation between the true stress and the engineering stress. Is that right? Yeah. Area. Yeah, so previously we saw dl by l, which is strain, is equal to minus dA by A, right? Now, uh, so how can you write uh, this A? So this is, uh, one second. So sigma t is equal to F by A. Uh, now, A is equal to... Um, minus d a by epsilon is that okay uh, okay let's not write it this way uh, let's say you are writing this in terms of the a naught so dl by l naught and d a by a naught so if you want area a naught plus a naught into d a or a naught d so a naught into this will become uh, 1 minus uh, epsilon okay or you can just write it in terms of uh, this thing simply Three mm. by one second. Mm. Okay. I am not exactly sure, I can, I'll uh, update you, but this will turn out to be something of this, sigma engineering into 1 plus epsilon, okay. Um, this is the engineering strain only and this is the engineering stress and true stress will be related to engineering strain and engineering stress in this way. instantaneous area and then uh, the strain are linked So, A naught by A you can write as 1 plus epsilon. Is that clear from this? Is this clear or should I derive once and then? Uh, 
So, sigma true, true stress is basically in terms of the load, actual load and the instantaneous area. So, is that okay? Now, we have seen earlier till necking dl by l is minus dA by A, right? So, dl by L is minus dA by A. So, which is the strain? Definition by definition, this is the engineering strain. Now, what is dA? Basically, change in area compared to initial area, right? So, this makes it A minus A naught is equal to minus epsilon A. Now, after necking, after necking, it is not, uh, you cannot uh, completely say it, it is maintained. So, now you can write A as A naught by 1 plus epsilon. Now, if you replace this here, sigma t is equal to f by A is A naught by 1 plus epsilon. So, this goes to the top. So, what is f by A naught? Is your engineering stress. So, this way mathematically you can relate true stress and engineering stress. Okay. So, but to actually measure it instantly during the force itself, so you need to track that instantaneous area, so which would be difficult. But once you have the engineering stress and engineering strain graph, you can get the true stress, okay. Yeah, but the question here is we were asked true stress at fracture. So, yeah, let us get back to that. Uh, so, now we know sigma engineering at fracture that gives us what is the force and area at fracture because uh, dia is given, so that is also given. So, these two values are given. So, you can estimate the force at fracture as sigma at into AF. Now, if you are writing this in terms of true stresses, so that would be sigma 2 at fracture should be force by uh, area at uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is A naught. So, engineering stress is always in terms of the initial area. This is the actual area at fracture. Okay, this is the true stress because you know F uh, sigma E into fracture into initial area by area final. Okay. So, this way you can estimate what is the stress, true stress at fracture. So, what is sigma E at fracture? It is around uh, this value. So, this is uh, this is 380, right? Around 380 MPa. So, 380 MPa into A naught, uh, which is uh, pi into D naught square by 4 by AF, which is pi into DF square by 4. So, 380 MPa into d naught square by df square. So, this way, uh, so if you substitute the values, you will get the sigma t f. So, d naught is uh, 10.7 by 12.8. So, if you see the value magnitude or the value actual value is greater, true stress is actually greater than the engineering stress. So, yeah, if you see the actual value, no, 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 did I write it correctly? Yeah, D naught is 12.8, right? By DF is 10.7, yeah. So, if you see this, sigma TF, this is sigma engineering, right? So, if you this ratio is 12.8 square by 10.7 square. So, this is obviously greater than 1. So, uh, when you calculate the engineering stress, that value does not actually tell you the fracture, uh, uh, true stress of the fracture. It actually underestimates. That means, the actual true stress of fracture is greater than the engineering stress which you would see at the fracture. Okay. Because of the necking, uh, you are actually, the stress is actually increasing the material even after necking. 
but engineering stress is actually showing decreasing but the true stress in the material is actually increasing so this is yes 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 so that is why the true stress would always be on the left side yeah true stress is always be higher than the engineering stress yeah okay yeah let's move on to the next question okay so yeah this is that next question yeah the just to be discussed now so engineering stress strain graph is given now how to estimate the true stress strain graph so we have seen this uh, previously only true stress and engineering stress relation so from the engineering stress points you can get the true stress points like this and how do you get the true strain so can anyone tell me how will we get the true strain true strain true strain i mean like we have true stress like this what is true strain no yes 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 but that is actually called the engineering strain so true strain if you actually see okay uh, let's see it this way okay so let's say that you are uh, uh, initially the sample is at 0 0 no loading okay uh this is the length of the sample now we have loaded it to some force so the length has become this okay when you say strain so you need to see from uh, uh, this point let's say you are giving even more load in a small even more load so when you say true strain it actually corresponds to these two points only because your initial length is different now in reality because uh, you have loaded till here and then you are adding one more small load so in that small both are uh, uh, let's see whether they are different or not so this small change in load is delta l but when you say engineering strain you actually talk from initial length to this length you don't worry about the in between parts okay but if you are worrying about the in between parts also uh, so uh, engineering strain you write delta l by l not initial length but in true strain uh, sorry in engineering strain initial delta change in length by initial length but in true strain you need to see the small change in length by at that instance length and this has been happening from uh, initial length to whatever length you are looking at okay okay so here when you have something like this if you uh, because this is l minus l not by l not Uh, so this is engineering strain into l not is l minus l not so l is equal to you can write it as l not into 1 plus epsilon engineering so this way you can write this as l is 1 by l not into 1 plus epsilon engineering into dl right is it yeah because this is already l in dl so you can just integrate this so because it's 1 by l so it's ln l is that okay is this true no right no it's true 
But what is ln L? Uh, if you put the limits, so initial uh, current length is L and initial length is L naught. So ln L minus ln L naught. So this is actually ln of L by L naught. So L and L naught are related like this. So this actually becomes uh, this thing. So true strain in terms of engineering strain, you can write like this. So is this clear? Yeah. So we need to take the instantaneous change in length and the corresponding length. The ratio of that is that instantaneous strain. But if you are looking from initial to that point, that is the total true strain that you need to integrate. So, if you integrate 1 by L dl, you will get ln L, but we know the limits, current length L and the initial starting point L naught. So, when you take all that, you will get true strain in terms of engineering strain like this. Okay. So, now you know sigma engineering and strain engineering from the graphs and you can estimate the sigma true and epsilon true like sigma true is sigma engineering uh, engineering stress into 1 plus engineering strain okay and uh, true strain is ln of 1 plus engineering strain so like this you can get these two points for every corresponding point of engineering stress and strain and then you can plot so if you plot that you would get something like the left side as we have seen earlier okay is this clear? So, you might be asked maybe one point, but in uh, if it is a subject exam, you might be asked to draw these graphs, but they might not. But this is how you can estimate true stress and true strain if you know the engineering stress and engineering strain, which we will know when we do the tensile test. Okay. Now, so for the given stress strain graph, estimate the length of sample in terms of original length if it is loaded to 240 MPa. So, here when I say length of sample, it is the final length of sample. Uh, so, what I mean there is uh, after unloading. So, what I mean here is you loaded it from uh, 0 to 240 MPa. Okay? and then unload it from there. So, after unloading, what is the final length? That is the question. So, can anyone tell me how to uh, solve this? You know the stress strain graph. You know that the sample is loaded to 240 MPa and then unloaded. Now, Compared to initial original length before even starting the tensile test, in terms of that length, what should be the length now after unloading? And we know that 240 MPa it is actually uh, because till 200 MPa you can see that it is straight, but after that it is uh, plastic deformation. So, 240 MPa is somewhere uh, this is 200, 210, so 240 MPa is this point. So, you can see that it is not uh, elastic deformation, plastic. So, the way how you get is, you just draw a line parallel to this elastic resin. Okay. So, wherever that intersects. So, that would be the final uh, plastic strain in the material. So, this strain uh, you are not able to get back. Okay. This is the permanent uh, deformation which happened in the material. So, if you know that strain, then you can get the length as uh, you can get the change in length as uh, L naught into epsilon this strain, uh, this strain, whatever this strain is. Now, in uh, final length is uh, L naught plus delta L. So, L naught into 1 plus epsilon engineering this corresponding point, this point. So, from that stress point, you need to draw a slope line parallel to the elastic resin. The point at which it intersects 
x axis or the zero stress so that point okay if you are in the elastic regime only let's say somewhere here then it would actually correspond to zero because elastic regime there is no permanent deformation okay only when the plastic deformation starts you need to see this is that clear any doubt anyone okay i hope it is clear ha huh. yeah hmm Uh, see homogeneous and heterogeneous basically means homogeneous means same everywhere heterogeneous means it's not same everywhere that's it yeah so till necking what is happening when you are stretching it everywhere it's like it behaves uh, every point is same but once the necking starts you can see at the necking zone the material is different than the zones which are far away from necking so it's not homogeneous anymore but that's the answer actually so i shouldn't say that anyway yeah homogeneous means same ah uh, no no ah uh, it's not exactly geometry you can say it's basically stress strains so till necking what is happening is everywhere the stress and strain are same inside the sample every location but after necking and during neck after necking any point you see the points which are at the neck and the points which are away from the neck will be different so till that they are same so that is what uh, here homogeneity means it, it's not exactly geometry okay you can't attribute it to geometry you attribute it to the stress and strains the way you are seeing it is the necking yeah Uh, i didn't get your question so if it's a problem like if it's some misunderstanding in the assignment just ask in the discussion forum i'll only check and answer that uh, later on okay yeah yeah so for uh, yeah see from the stress strain equation if ah uh, that i'll come to uh, that is one question here okay i'll come to it yeah next question i think so this question i won't spend much time so these are direct formulas how to estimate the shear modulus and the bulk modulus in terms of elastic modulus and poisson ratio uh, so linear elastic isotropic material so these formulas actually come if you derive the uh, if you write linear elastic isotropic material in terms of the uh lamas constants lambda and mu stress and strains considering all the nine, six components if you write the full equations from there you can derive these relations but now i'll just write these equations okay so any can anyone tell me how to what is the shear modulus in terms of elastic modulus and poisson ratio yeah yes okay yeah so isotropic means uh, you are doing this tensile test right let's take simple tensile test only you have a cylindrical sample okay you are doing this tensile test uh can, sanjay can you mute your yeah. somewhere i can see the noise can uh, yeah so you have a block okay you have a solid block from that you are cutting three tensile uh, three cylindrical samples okay so one sample you cut like this from a square block and one sample you cut like this 
and one sample you are cutting like this. Okay. Now, you did the tensile test in all, all these three samples. If they are exactly same, that means independent of the direction which you are doing, the material properties are same. So, that is the isotropic material. Isotropic, ISO. So, independent of whatever direction you are looking at, all these elastic modulus, shear modulus, everything would be same. But anisotropic material, they do not have to be same. That is the full anisotropic material. So, there are multiple cases here. Full anisotropic, orthotropic, transversely isotropic. and then isotropic. Isotropic is the most simplest case and anisotropic is the most complex case. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, do you know how to relate uh, all the stress components with the, all the strain components? Yeah. In reality, this is how stress and strain are related. Considering all the components, because we know stress is a tensor, strain is a tensor. I think this might be too much for this course. So, in reality, stress and strain will each have 9 components. And then, because they are symmetric, it boils down to 6 components. And if you relate these 6 with these 6, this would have 36 relations. So, what I mean is, uh, So, like this if you write, for each equation there will be 6 constants and there will be 6 equations. So, total 36 constants. So, this material which has all these 36 different uh, no symmetries or anything that is the full anisotropic material. In the isotropic material, you would have only 2 constants. If you know these 2, you can get all these 36 values. So, that is how these come. I think they are a little advanced for this course. Uh, if you go, you can just Google them, you can find uh, these relations. Okay. Yeah. In ortho, uh, so in isotropic, as I said, all these 36 would be there. In ortho, what happens is uh, uh, the non diagonal components uh, would go to zeros. So, it would have only 21 constants. So, not the uh, not all the half diagonal components, some of them will go to 0 and it will have only 21 constants. Yeah. So, isotropic only 2, this would have all 36. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the question. Uh, you are given true stress strain is related by this power law and what would be the UTS, ultimate tensile strength? I think this is the last question. So, we saw that uh, in engineering stress and engineering strain graph, uh, this is how the graph is, right? And this point is the ultimate tensile strain. Is that clear? Yeah. So, uh, if you see in terms of forces, the ultimate tensile strength is the point where the force peaks, like the maximum force that the material can handle. So, after which it starts necking and the actual force decreases. Okay, so uh, if you say force as uh, F, then the point at which this force peaks is the UTS or if you take this uh, true stress, engineering stress, engineering strain graph, this point that is uh, because when the slope is 0, uh, the derivative should be 0. Is that clear? At a global maxima or a minima, the slope would be 0, right? Because it is increasing, the slope becomes 0 and then decreasing. Slope direction value changes, sign. So, the derivative is 0. Now, what is force actually? In terms of engineering, it would be this, right? Engineering stress into initial area. But if you are writing in terms of true stress and true strain, 
this would be this right current area and current stress okay so now we need df to be zero what is df d sigma t at plus sigma t d at okay now this should be zero so let's uh, equal to zero so let's write this in terms of d sigma t uh, at is equal to minus sigma t d at so what we can write this as minus d sigma t by sigma t is equal to let's put the minus here minus d at by at so this we know right what is this da by a basically dl by l is that uh, do you guys remember that this relation we derived earlier okay now what is this dl by l is this relation d epsilon t in terms of true strain so what is this d sigma t by d epsilon t is sigma t so at the region of necking so this is still necking so that is why this uh, you can still use till necking you can use this so because we are at the point of necking i am using that so that means the slope of true stress strain graph at ultimate tensile strength is actually equal to the true stress because now we know stress strain relation between true stress and true strain so sigma t is given as k into epsilon t power n what is the slope uh, d sigma t by d epsilon t is Sorry, one minus one. So is that okay? Now this you can write as power n into n by okay n uh, power n by one. I am writing like this. So what is this? K epsilon power t is actually sigma t. And then what is this? the slope of this stress to strain is sigma t so at the point of necking n is equal to epsilon t okay so if you are given uh, this equation uh, sigma is equal to k epsilon t power n and if you know k and n values okay uh, let's say k is uh, 900 mpa and uh, n is point uh, i don't know take one point to some some value i am not sure what should be in so at the necking or at the ultimate tensile strength n is epsilon t so if you substitute that corresponding k epsilon t instead of that n power n you can get the ultimate tensile strength in terms of true stress okay is this clear yeah basically in terms of strain you need to just put this n the exponent so that's uh yeah but uh, n uh, if it is strain then yeah so in this assumption these are the values but uh, n i am not sure what could be the values for it so if you know the exact values uh, just put those exact values okay oh okay okay yeah then take point so i was not exactly sure on that that's why okay is this clear now so at necking this is the condition so if you know that condition you can get uh, anything so i think that is it for uh, today uh, we have crossed the time actually but yeah uh, any more doubts
uh, i will upload this uh, video in the youtube today itself and i'll uh, uh, in that uh, google docs uh, no google sheet you will find the links right i'll upload the there today itself so you can see all the questions there okay yes Uh, you want this with some example, huh? the last question? Okay, okay. I'll uh, ch check the test book and find some example question and I'll put it there. Okay? Yeah. Okay then. Uh, and that reduction in area also, I'll check whether it is AF minus A0 or A0 minus AF. Okay? Yeah. Okay, then we'll meet again next week. Uh, thank you everyone. You can leave now.